Good morning, my fellow HB seers. Again, I wish we could be together, but we're not. I'd like to welcome you to the Easter season. Can you believe it? We've made it through winter, we're into spring, and here we are the Easter season, which of course begins with Palm Sunday, where we find ourselves today. And I'm looking forward to getting into this and talking about all of these things with you today. Before I do that though, I would like to give a shout out. We have a number of folks from our church that are essential workers. And I know that there's more than what I'm gonna list right now, but the ones that I want to list are those that work for either the a police department or work for the medical establishment. And I would like to just share a couple of their names so you can remember to pray for them. Of course, we have Carl, who's working for the Sheriff's Department, and uh, please remember him. We have Wendy, who works up in Gaylord at the hospital there. And then we have Jill, who's an occupational therapist, and Heather, who's an occupational therapist. Don't forget our animal friends. We have Whitney, who works at the animal hospital. And uh, then we have Bob, who has been working with the snowmobile patrol. Now, he's probably done now, but uh, we'll wait and see how that works out and where they can use them from here. And then we have Mark and Dee who both work for, by uh, shuttling information between hospitals and doctor's visits and doctor's offices. And uh, remember to pray for them as they do their job. They really cover a lot of Northern Michigan. Now, I also know that there's a number of relatives of ours, of our, our folks from church here that work in these things as well. So remember to pray for all of them. But we're extremely pleased with our folks who are doing their job in these areas. And uh, we just want you guys to know that we're proud of you and uh, we hope that things continue to go well for you as far as uh, we've been hearing so far. Now I'd like us to begin our time with a word of prayer and then we'll get into a song and I encourage you to worship along with us as the song is playing. Father, thank you that you have allowed us to come together in this way. Uh, we know it's not as good as being together physically, being able to enjoy each other's presence and encourage each other. But Father, we pray that you would bless our virtual visit as we're together today. And uh, help us, Lord, to bring honor to you and to encourage one another. Thank you, Father. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now sing along with us as we sing the song, The Power of the Cross.
Isn't that a beautiful song? I hope you were able to sing along with us and worship with us as we did that. I have some announcements that I'd like to make, so bear with me as I do that. First of all, I want to talk about the stay-at-home order that's been issued to us by our governor. Can I encourage you to please take that seriously? And please remember that we do need to stay home. We do need to make sure that we're only out when it is on necessary business and necessary chores. Uh, remember to keep safe. And the quicker we can get past this thing, the quicker we can have this lockdown ended. And uh, also remember that we as a church have a testimony to keep. And we want to make sure that we're not the cause of any of the problems that can come about by a larger outbreak from this COVID virus. People have said things to me about our Easter service, which will be next week. And I have put quite a bit of thought into it. I've uh, listened to what other pastors have to say about what they want to do. Maybe some of you have heard the idea of having a drive up service. We have entertained that idea, but we're not going to do that. There are a number of logistical issues that come into play with that. And we want to be careful that in having a service like that and then needing bathroom facilities and so forth, that we don't do anything that could help spread any potential virus or give us a poor testimony as our neighbors look on and could possibly accuse us of not caring about what's happening with this situation. We do care and we want to make wise choices with that. Also, many of you may be thinking that this is the first of the month and we should be having a communion service either this week or next week. I've toyed with some different ideas on what we could do with that. And, and again, I've heard different things that other churches are trying as well. And I don't think we're going to try to actually have uh, the bread and the cup. Instead, we will do what it was meant to do, and that is remember what the Lord Jesus has done. So be watching for that. Probably next week, we'll do a virtual communion service together. Now, those of you grandmothers who come and bring your kids to our services, you know who you are. Uh, Lynn is preparing a packet for the kids. So I just want you to be looking for that or maybe let the kids know that it's coming. And uh, this will be an Easter theme packet and it'll involve lessons as well as activities for them to be involved with. Uh, Lynn has been putting some time into thinking through some of those things. So be watching for those packets to come. And then uh, I would also like to say thank you to those of you who are continuing to give, even though we are not having our services. Uh, we're grateful for that. And the Lord is uh, meeting our needs through your giving and through your generosity. Thank you very much for that. And uh, just keep in mind that the church still has bills. We still have an electric bill, even though it's not as great as it would be if we were there. We still have a gas bill and, and other things. We have insurances that needed to be paid. So thank you for those of you who are participating uh, through your giving and uh, keeping our church's organization moving forward as it ought to. Okay, I believe that's all of our announcements at this point. I would like to say that if any of you can think of announcements that the rest of the group needs to know, please get them to me, send them through email or mail them to me through snail mail, and I will do my best to include them so that everyone else can hear uh, the information that they need to hear and glean from. Well, let's sing one more song before we get into our Bible study time. This one is The Wonderful Cross.
Once again, I'd like to say welcome to Palm Sunday, which is the start of our Easter season, our Easter celebration. And today I would like us to look at Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem the week before he was crucified. Before we do that, though, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're so grateful for what you have done for us as human beings. You have provided for our salvation. Uh, you have reached out to us, even though we as a race have turned away from you. Uh, we're grateful, Father, for your love and kindness toward us, even in the midst of you still being a God who upholds your holiness and your justice. And we're grateful, Father, for your love extended toward us. Open our hearts today, Lord, as we look at this passage. May we learn much about what the scriptures have to say and how it should guide our living. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We all know that there's a lot of things in life that are different than how they appear at first. Let me give you a couple examples. I'm a football fan, but there's one thing if you're a football fan you'll always notice, and that is when your team scores a go-ahead touchdown, and yet you've left two minutes on the clock for the other team. Quite often that's a problem, especially for those of us who are Detroit Lion fans. We know what that means. A good team, a good quarterback, that's plenty of time for them to march back down and take the lead from you. So just because you got the lead so late in the game doesn't mean you're going to win the game. Um, as I've been in not only this church, but in other churches, I've seen times when the church has been given gifts. And that sounds wonderful. Hey, our church has been given a great gift, but, you know, free gifts aren't always as wonderful as they seem either. For instance, what if someone were to give us an old couch? Now, what is our church going to do with an old couch? We don't have another building somewhere where we can stick the couch. We don't have a, a large uh, fellowship room where a couch would be great to go. And really, for us, it would be an albatross around our necks. It wouldn't be all that great. Now we would have to figure out how to dispose of that old couch. So a lot of times being given a free gift is not as good as it seems. I heard a story this past week as I was preparing for this about a water skier. There was a fellow who was skiing along on a lake and his family was in another boat. And as he was skiing along, he came around near their boat and he saw his wife and mother waving at him. Well, he just waved back and thought that was kind of neat, kept on skiing down the lake. But what he didn't realize was what was going on in that boat where his mother and wife were come to find out later that his sister had fallen overboard and she was struggling in the water. And so his dad dove into the water to try to rescue his sister and they ended up both drowning. And when the skier was coming around, his mother and wife were not waving because it was just a nice day. They were waving frantically, trying to get their attention to come and help, but they didn't realize that. So there again was something that was very different than what it seemed. Well, as we consider Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, uh, we need to look at it because I think sometimes if we just read in a quick fashion, we can think what a wonderful day that was when maybe there was more to what was going on behind the scenes. Think about this. Uh, as Jesus was having his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, there were excited crowds. There was a, a special treatment that was being given to Jesus. It was a very king-like treatment, and it looked wonderful, and it sounded like a happy time. The crowds were singing songs that they quite often sing when they come into Jerusalem for Passover. But Jesus had a very different outlook on this whole situation than what the crowds did. And I want us to consider it. Well, as we get into it, consider the context. First of all, there's an excitement that's going on here because of the Passover festival. Uh, there were Jews from all over that part of the world that were ascending upon uh, Jerusalem. And it was a happy, festive time. As far as numbers go, there's, there's a number of different estimates. But I've heard different ones, even from the idea that Jerusalem had a population of about 30,000. Yet for Passover, it swelled to over 100. 180,000. So roughly, it was um, six times the normal population that Jerusalem would have. So it was it was exciting time. There was a lot of fun things going on, a lot of interesting things. Imagine if you were a kid in the crowd and you watched all this stuff going on. It, you would be wide-eyed, and it'd be an amazing time. And actually, some of you will remember, we've looked at some Old Testament passages where God has designed the festival times for Israel so that they could enjoy themselves. 
They were to come for these festivals. They were to eat. They were to fellowship. They were to enjoy all that was going on because God wanted his people to have joy. Of course, there was significance of what the specific festivals were all about, and they would, they would uh, recognize those things, but it was meant to be a joyful time. And that certainly was happening as um, the Passover festival was about to take place here. Now, as Jesus is getting ready to come into the city of Jerusalem, there were a number of miracles that he performed leading up to this, and that created some excitement because there were a lot of people watching what was going on. And you can tell by reading some of the passages that people were talking about Jesus behind the scenes. Just consider a couple miracles. It was as he was coming toward Jerusalem for this that he healed the blind man named Bartimaeus. A lot of people saw that. And so that created a lot of chatter going on in the crowd. It was also uh, this time leading up to uh, the triumphal entry that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And that created a lot of buzz as well. And people were, were wondering about this miracle. They had known that he died. Not only the regular people, but the religious leaders were thinking about it. So this was all in the air. And, and the Gospel of John is the one who spends the most time talking about Lazarus and so forth. But I'd like to read his version of the triumphal entry. And this begins in John chapter 12. I want to begin reading at verse 12. He says, the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they had heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. That is, of course, John's version, and he includes the idea that because of Lazarus raising, that people were excited about that. Well, there were a few other things going on during this time as well. You remember each of the stories record Jesus and the donkey. Now, John only records the fact that Jesus rode on him, but the other Gospels record that Jesus went to great lengths to get that donkey and to have it there. Why did the Gospel writers spend so much time talking about it? What were they trying to prove in telling the story? Well, I believe it's because it has messianic meaning. In fact, John 12, 15, where um, the a prophet is quoted about Jesus coming and riding the donkey's colt, is actually a quote from Zechariah 9, verse 9. And the people of Israel would have known this quote in looking forward to the Messiah coming. So there was definitely a messianic meaning there, and that just added to the excitement. So with all these things happening, with the festival happening, with Jesus performing these miracles and others that we haven't even mentioned, and with this whole thing with the donkey and and it was just a, an interesting setup the air was electric and and yes people were excited about this sort of thing well i want to look at the two different reactions now first of all i want to look at the the crowd's reaction to this they were excited they were excited about several things and and who can blame them because there were all these things happening but with deeper reflection you can see that what the crowds were excited about may have been the wrong things. I'll show you what I mean as we go on about that. First of all, they were excited about the, the miracles, and, and they're right to be excited about miracles. That would be exciting. I would love to have the Lord Jesus come and do some of these miracles in front of us. Wouldn't it be neat for him to go into some of our hospitals, especially downstate where so many people are dying from this COVID-19, and actually uh, raise some of these people up and, and banish that virus from there? He certainly has the power to do that, even though he's choosing not to do it at this point, but that'd be exciting. And these people had the the exciting opportunities to see those things. So the, the miracles were, were a, a neat thing for them to see. However, what were their expectations in line of these miracles? Were they expecting that this would be a regular occurrence? 
or did they recognize them as signs? You see, I believe that the Lord Jesus did these miracles as signs. In fact, it even mentioned it in John's passage here that they saw the sign that was given. It's pointing towards something else. Uh, and I, that's what was happening. But I think some of these people might have thought if Jesus could do these miracles, he could do them all the time. Imagine what that would do if, if sickness was banished forever and everyone was healed. Well, Jesus had the power to do that. But did you think about the fact that he chose not to do that? Yes, there were healings, but there were plenty of people who weren't healed. You can go back in history, and, and I've even heard people ask this, boy, maybe if we could uh, go and examine the deaths that happened while Jesus was alive on the earth and see how fewer there were. I don't think you'd find fewer. I would think you would still find the same number. It would be about there. Jesus didn't come at that time to banish death. That's coming in the future. But the signs pointing to who he was, that's what he was doing. And I think the crowds were probably wrong in this case. They were looking for that now. Let me show you what I mean. There is another story that illustrates this. In John chapter 6, we have the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And if you were to go back and read that whole story, what you would find is after Jesus fed the 5,000, you'd find these verses here. This is from John chapter 6, verse 15. It says, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again in the mountains by himself alone. Did you get that? They were going to come and by force make him king. It almost sounds like some of our politicians today, they make all kinds of promises. And of course, the people who want those promises fulfilled may cast their vote for that particular one. Well, that's what they were kind of doing with Jesus here. They thought, look, the guy can give us free food. He can give us free medical care. He can give us free lots of other things. Look at all this stuff that we can get. Let's make him king. And even though this was happening back in uh, the feeding of the 5,000, I think that also has something to do with what was happening with the triumphal entry. Let me go on with the feeding of the 5,000. I read verse 15 of chapter 6. Now let me read verse 26 and 27. The people found him after he had crossed the lake, and they, they came to him, and they were still pressing him. And this is what he said. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for food which perishes, but for food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. You see, Jesus recognized what they wanted were the physical things. But he said, these are signs pointing to greater spiritual things. That's what you should be striving after. So yes, they were excited about the miracles. The crowd was also excited about the kingdom idea. They wanted their kingdom. They wanted a physical, earthly kingdom. They wanted Jesus to come and drive the Romans out. They were an occupied nation. And and they thought that the Messiah's main job was come was to come and to drive out these other forces so that they could be free. We know in the future, when, when the scriptures talk about what Jesus is going to do in his second coming, that he will be doing uh, some of those things. But at this point, there was a more important kingdom, and that was the kingdom of spiritual renewal. Remember in Jeremiah chapter 31, where uh, Jeremiah is prophesying of the new covenant that is to come? And one of the things that he talks about in there is that God's law is going to be put within your hearts. God's going to make you righteous. That's what they should have been looking for more. But they were excited about this kingdom. Um, they did not want what Jesus was going to offer to them. Jesus was going to offer them his own rejection, his own suffering, and his own humiliation. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, does it? If you want a king and you want to be victorious, that doesn't sound like what you want. Now, those of us who are believers, we understand as we even celebrate the communion service that we're celebrating what Jesus did. He gave of his body and he shed his blood. Well, why can we celebrate that? Because it was, in fact, a great victory. It provided for our salvation. I remember as a kid reading uh, some stories about Jesus being crucified, and I remember thinking, boy, he should just come down from that cross and, and dash all those people away and, and have victory. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, what would have happened if he had done that? My salvation wouldn't have been procured. 
he wouldn't have died to pay the penalty for my sins. Where would I be then? Now, Jesus had to go through those things, but that wasn't what the crowd was looking for. Why do you think a week from the triumphant entry that so many of these people in the same crowd are going to be shouting, crucify him, crucify him, that are now saying, welcome thou son of David, the king of kings. Yeah, they're, they're going to flip-flop on this. And I believe it's because they were looking at the wrong things on what they wanted. You know, even the disciples did not put it all together until after uh, this was all done, after Jesus rose from the grave and was glorified. In fact, that's what John says here in uh, John chapter uh, John chapter 12, verse 16. says his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things about him. So it's going to take them a while. In fact, if you go, even after Jesus rose from the grave, before it all uh, unfolded what he was going to do through the church and so forth, in uh, Acts chapter Acts chapter 1, verse 6, the disciples asked the Lord when they were walking with him before he ascended into heaven, they said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They were still looking for that physical kingdom. Now, again, Jesus is going to do that, but that's future. At this point, it was a spiritual kingdom that he was most looking after. It was the, the, uh, the growth of the church. And that's what they were going to learn, and they were going to have to uh, put into practice very soon. Now, that was the crowd's reactions. What about the Lord's reactions? You would think on one hand that it'd be exciting for him. He's being treated as a king. The only time, really, during his earthly ministry that he was treated like this, you would think he'd be excited about that. But the Lord saw through all of that, and the Lord saw what was really happening. And I want to just consider that uh, for a little bit. The, the scriptures teach us that Jesus actually shed tears on this day. I'm going to leave John's gospel and go to the gospel of Luke. And in Luke's story of the uh, triumphal entry, I want to look at uh, Luke chapter 19. And as Jesus is coming into the city, and as they're doing all these things, laying down their coats, putting the palm branches on the road, and they're singing these songs and shouting these things that they were saying, Jesus comes around the corner, it almost sounds like, and he sees Jerusalem. And here's his response. Luke 19, verse 41. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. What Jesus is saying is that you did not know when the Messiah was there. You did not know who he really was. You did not know what he was there to do, and therefore you rejected him. And these things are going to come to pass. And in fact, they did. I believe he's referring to A.D. 70, when Rome surrounded Jerusalem and completely destroyed the city. I believe that's what he's talking about there. And these things happen because Israel rejected their Messiah, rejected his spiritual purpose of what he was there for. So Jesus was uh, shedding tears over them as he was coming into the city. Again, the people of Jerusalem were the ones who were meeting him and cheering him on, and yet they didn't know really what was going on. In fact, you could make a bigger claim that they were actually rejecting Jesus by getting excited for different purposes and looking for other purposes than what Jesus was really there for. They weren't accepting what he was there for. They were rejecting that and accepting what they wanted and what they felt was best. Now, you could also say that Jesus shed tears for the temple. Luke goes on and shares a story that Jesus went into the temple and he cleansed the temple. And that's, remember, where he drove out the money changers and he overturned their tables and so forth. Well, think about this from a Jewish perspective. You're expecting Jesus to come in, if you were of the crowd, and you're expecting him to come in and drive out the Romans. What did Jesus do instead? Instead of driving out the Romans... He drove out the people that the high priest had put into the temple to sell these wares and get people ready for, for the uh, services coming up. Uh, he was attacking the Jews' religious lives 
instead of attacking Roman soldiers. It wasn't what they wanted. But yet Jesus came to provide salvation first. That's what he was there for. And they weren't looking for that at all. They had their own agenda and their own plans. This might raise a question in your mind. Why did Jesus participate in the triumphal entry then? Why would he even participate in that if what Pastor Ernie is saying is so, that the crowds had the wrong mindset and Jesus was looking at it from a different angle? Well, I believe there are several reasons for that. First of all, he was fulfilling prophecy. There's a number of prophecies that prophesy that Jesus would come to the city in this way. I think of the prophecies from Jeremiah about the donkey. Think of the other prophecies that talk about the Messiah being given a king's reception. Well, he had to go through this for those things to happen. Um, he had to also go through this to identify as the Messiah. He wanted to show them that he was the Messiah. And in fact, the leaders of Israel caught that because they rebuked Jesus and said, you need to quiet these people down with what they're saying. And Jesus said, no, this is what they need to be saying. So he was identifying as the Messiah. I also think he was identifying the type of kingdom he was going to have. He didn't come in as a conquering hero on a great white steed and, and driving the Romans out. Instead, he came in in a meek, humble way. He came in on this colt of a donkey, this foal of a donkey. And uh, he was not being a militaristic leader. Instead, he was being a humble Messiah, a humble Savior. And I don't think the people recognize that. And then, of course, by participating in this, it gave more fuel to his enemies so that within seven days from now, from here, they're going to take him and crucify him. And he will actually be able to die as the sacrificial lamb for not only Israel, but for the sins of the entire world. So, yes, Jesus had a right to be participating in this, even if the people were taking it in a different direction than what he intended that to be. And uh, he still was meeting his purposes in doing that. So I want you to think of, think of the fact that not everything is as it always appears to be. We certainly see it in this story. While it appears uh, like a triumphant scene, it appears that, that, that everyone's excited and all these people love Jesus, which, by the way, I do believe some in the crowd did love Jesus and did follow him as the Messiah. But the majority of the crowd, the largeness of the crowd, no, they were looking for another Messiah, a Messiah of their own thinking. And that wasn't what they were getting. But think of the things that we do in Christianity anyway that aren't as they seem, that are different from what they seem. I mentioned communion. Just think about that. We're celebrating that he, he gave his body. His body was battered and bruised for us. We're celebrating that he spilled his blood. And yet we rejoice over those things. Doesn't that seem like an odd thing to rejoice over? Well, it would, except that this is what Jesus came to provide for our salvation. And the fact that we know what follows, that's what we're going to celebrate next week in Easter. He rose from the grave. The grave couldn't hold him. And so therefore we can celebrate it and we can rejoice in the fact that God has provided for our salvation in that way. Think of a few other things. Think about the idea that um, the, the scriptures talk about us being washed as white as snow by his blood. Doesn't that seem odd if you really think about that for a minute? We're washed white as snow by blood. Have you ever gotten blood stains on your clothes that were hard to get out? I think uh, some of you that are used to doing laundry would understand, yeah, that can be a tough thing to do. And yet the scriptures talk about his blood washing us as white as snow. I wonder sometimes what people outside of the church think when they hear us talk in that kind of language. And it must seem really uh, odd to them. That's why we introduce them to the gospel so they can understand and go, oh, I see. And, and, and in fact, that brings us to more facts about the gospel. The Bible talks about the fact that Jesus took on our sin and we took on his righteousness. What a wonderful thing. Uh, consider this for a moment. God loves us, but God is more than just a God of love. He's a great, vast, transcendent God. So he has a lot more characteristics than just love. He also has the characteristics of holiness and the characteristics of, of uh, justice. And yes, God loves us, but God still has to maintain his, his righteousness, and he still has to deal with sin, and that's what we see in him. But then we look at humans, mankind, and we see that, yes, God loves us, but he hates our sin. 
because we as a human race have turned away from him through Adam and Eve. We turned away from him and, and we have sinned in that way. But then every single one of us, after we're born and start growing, we demonstrate our sinfulness. We prove that we are, in fact, a genuine part of this human race. We're sinners. So what does that do for us? You've got God who loves us, but he must punish sin, uphold his standards of righteousness and justice. What, what do we do about that? Well, that's where the Lord Jesus comes in. Uh, the scriptures teach us that, the, that God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to become a man so that he could take on the punishment that belongs to man and he could take it for us in a substitutionary way. That's what the Lord Jesus has done. Uh, th think of it like this. Let's suppose this is, uh, this is us and this is a record of our sins. Well, that book would be a lot thicker than that, believe me. But but as God sees us, he sees our sin, and that sin must be punished. Well, Jesus came, and God allowed our sins to be placed on Jesus. And now God can punish our sins on Jesus while he's on the cross. So Jesus suffered the punishment for us. And now when God sees us, he can see us without that sin. You see, Jesus took on our sin. We took on his righteousness. And we, we take on his righteousness by faith. The scriptures say that by faith we believe and we're, we're given the gift of eternal life. We believe that Jesus is God's son, that Jesus did come and die for the sins of the world, including my sins and your sins. And that we, when we ask God to forgive us, he forgives us based on those things. And now God sees us as one of his clean sons, one of his children. We receive that by faith. That's faith, believing that Jesus is what the scriptures say that he is. So that's the gospel. That's what he came for. That's why he came on this day, uh, the day of Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, so that he could come and provide himself a sacrifice for our sins. That's what people will be celebrating on Good Friday next week, that Jesus went to the cross and he was there uh, suffering for our sins and giving us the opportunity to turn to God and receive Jesus's righteousness. Well, there is uh, some other things that we can glean from this passage. Uh, one that I just want to point out here is we need to be careful of what I've heard called triumphalism. And what that is, triumphalism is where uh, you think everything is going to be great. Everything is going to be wonderful. Everything's going to go our way. Let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, the Jews wanted victory. The Jews were guilty of triumphalism. When Jesus came, all they wanted was victory. They wanted the Romans driven out. They wanted to have their own kingdom. They wanted to have their own freedom. They wanted all those things, which those things are good things to want. But that's all that they were really after. Uh, they were missing out on the idea that the Lord was offering them a chance to repent of their sins and to turn to Jesus as their Messiah and receive forgiveness. But that wasn't what they wanted. They wanted the joyful things. Uh, we can be guilty of the same thing in our day and age as well. We want blessings. We want peace. We want victory. That's pretty understandable that we want those things. But sometimes that's all we want. And in fact, some people within Christian circles can preach that that's what it's all about. It's all about having those victories, those that peace, uh, those blessings. And they push you to just consider just those things. However, if you continue reading on through the scriptures, take Peter and Paul, for instance, two of Jesus's apostles that went on to be key players in establishing the church. They both taught that we will have to go through suffering and we'll have to go through trials while we're on this journey on our way to heaven. God uses suffering and trials to, to purify us. God uses suffering and trials to develop our character, to develop our faith. In fact, Paul even refers to it as, as suffering for Christ because he, he's bringing you to be more like Christ as you're going through those things. Well, we need to be careful that we're not guilty of only looking for the fun things, but realizing that God is working out his uh, plan for the ages. And part of that plan includes us having to go through some difficult times. And uh, we need to be willing to do that. We need to have a, a, a spiritual mindset that says, I am willing to submit to God's plans. And, and if that means that there'll be some things that are not necessarily uh, joyful for me right now, I'm still willing to go through that. If uh, that means that God's going to put me in situations that, that will be difficult, but may give me an opportunity to serve others through that, I'm going to strive to serve others to do those things. We need to be careful that we allow God to do his work. Just like Jesus was with the, uh, the Jews of Jerusalem, 
um, he was showing them that he had a plan of what he was going to do, and it wasn't necessarily what they thought. And yet he was going to work it out. And aren't you glad he did? He's worked out the plan for our salvation. He's worked out the details of the gospel. So now we can go into all the world and proclaim that you all can turn to the Lord Jesus for forgiveness of your sins through faith. Uh, let's be servants of God during this day, especially now as we're getting into our Easter season and we're considering what the Lord Jesus has done. A lot of people are thinking about that these days, especially with this holiday upon us. Uh, we need to have a word ready to share if they were to say something around us and the opportunity presents itself. Let's serve the Lord and um, be, be profitable for the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, giving us your scriptures and teaching us through them. Uh, help us, Lord, to learn that, that you do have plans and you are working these plans out. And uh, sometimes those plans are going to include things that uh, we may not like. Lord, we know that you bless us. We know that you pour out so many blessings upon us. But Father, we also know that reality says that you allow most of us, if not all of us, to go through times of suffering, through times of difficulty. Uh, help us to be willing to go through those times just as well as the good times because we know that you are in control we know that your plan is working out and we know that the lord jesus christ is going to return and fulfill all these promises that you've made through him and for him thank you father i pray this in jesus name amen before we go i would like us to sing uh, one more song together and it's a song about viewing the cross that the lord jesus christ has died on i come to the cross Please sing with us. <laughs> 